Hey folks, today we've got our very first interview on the e-commerce money map podcast. Our guest is Heather Smith. Salim and Heather get into some really interesting topics, such as the data flow of an e-commerce business, what a specialized accountant can do for e-commerce business owners, and what a typical cloud-based app stack might look like. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Salim Omar here with another episode. I have a very special guest today. Her name is Heather Smith. She is the hype girl for accounting apps. She's the host of the accounting technology podcast, Cloud Stories, publishes the accounting apps newsletter, author of Zero for Dummies, and runs a practice from her handbag. She's obsessed with how effective automation and integration can produce timely clean data to surface information for informed decision making. Heather, welcome. Thank you so much, Salem, for having me on the show. Really looking forward to our conversation. Very cool. Tell me a bit about yourself. So I'm based here in Brisbane and I am um, I, I fell in love with accounting when I was about 14 years old. I recognized it was something that I could um, use, support people and travel the world with. And um, sort of as, as time has evolved, I've realized that I can be anywhere and my clients can be anywhere because I use digital technology to support my client base. And I'm very um, interested in the evolution of accounting apps. So these are apps that connect in with your accounting solution that improve workflows. And as um, um, you mentioned in the bio, they assist the business owner in making an informed decision. I don't believe that the data should be the whole decision. I think that business owners should still um, rely somewhat on their gut instinct and their insights and their experience. But we have the opportunity to gather together an immense amount of data and look at it and analyze it and make informed decisions from that. And depending on what sort of um, business you're operating, you can pull these solutions together to actually um, have, a, 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 have the opportunity to have data flowing through the solutions so that you're just really minimizing um, manual input and that you're sort of uh, maximizing what you can get out of the data in there. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Now, USA Accounting Today recognized you as one of the 21 people helping shape and reshape the accounting industry. So you've been a big, major influence, not only in the accounting space, but in the e-commerce space as well. And you worked with lots of businesses in, in e-commerce, been an advisor, a spokesperson in that space as well. What are some good practices that e-commerce businesses could adopt from the start? Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, no, I was very proud to be um, um, named by uh, Accounting Today in that that role, uh, in that sort of uh, area. And I spent, I'm, I'm old now, um, and I spent a lot of my career helping um, businesses with the granular detail of what they were doing. And I've now stepped back a bit so I can maybe help a lot more businesses um, through information and insight. So with the e-commerce businesses that I have worked with, what are some good practices that they can adopt? Planning. Planning for what they're hoping to achieve. And when they start up, the processes and the practices they put in place, look at them and work out are they going to grow with their business? So, for example, and I'll give you a, a simple example here. I had one client, and this is something that you may find in the e-commerce space, and that she was selling jewelry. She was making jewelry and selling it online. And she had gone out and she'd found all these different platforms that would sell it online for her. But all of them fed through their information in different ways. So she never knew what her inventory levels were and everything relied on hundreds of post-it notes literally scattered all over her office. She never knew how much stock she needed to get in and she was spending an awful lot of time trying to understand what was actually happening in her business. The problem with these platforms was they didn't integrate with anything. So what I would like to see 
is an inventory solution. I know, a boring, boring inventory solution, but inventory is where your money is at. Mm. An inventory solution plugged into all of those platforms so that you have really clear ideas that if you're selling on Amazon or if you're selling on Etsy or if you're selling on Dinky Dye, this other little platform that's that's, that's set up, you still know how much inventory you have and you know what you're pulling, what's potentially going to sell, and you know um, you have the ability to plan to get more inventory in to fill those particular orders. And what I sat down with this lady and I said she had all these platforms, she, she was managing, she was managing, but just only just. And I said, what happens if you sell jewellery, suddenly your jewellery is being worn by Chloe, Chloe Kardashian? And all of a sudden, 5,000 orders come in overnight and you walk in that office and 5,000 orders come in overnight, what are you going to do? And she said, cry, because there's no way she could have coped with it. She could have coped with delivering it, but she just couldn't have, it would just have been an almighty mess. So I want to have those processes in place so that you do have the ability to grow from the start. And that was one of the key things and one of the key trip ups that I saw in the e-commerce space, because I do think it's easy to get started. And uh, we saw in this dreadful times during COVID, March 2020, a massive increase in spike in the number of people looking to e-commerce apps such as Shopify and um they can they can implement them. They they're, they're pretty. They appear to be pretty straightforward to implement them. But as with everything, you want to make sure they're all set up right. Yeah. And do you see Heather this as not having this set up right as a barrier to scaling a business, an e-commerce business? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's water flow. <laughs> it's it's we talk about data flow, but but it's data flow. It's water flow. If you don't have things set up right. You're losing things. You're losing track of things. You're losing track of orders. Um, you're probably wasting too much time trying to get new clients when if you had a really great flow in there, you would be pulling the client data in and then you would be, and I'm not the marketing person here, but you would have someone um, um, focused on the marketing. You would be um, nurturing that relationship with the client, the customer, and automation can very much do that for you. So we really want to look at, if you're going to do it, look how you can scale. And a lot of the solutions will have starting at a very light, low price point, going up to um, a higher price point, depending on the actual turnover there. And some of them are based on dollar turnover and some some of them are based on volume turnover which seems a bit (laughs) for some people that's going to work out okay and for some people that's not going to work out okay very good very insightful why should an e-commerce business seek out an accountant that specializes in e-commerce there's a number of reasons why you should, if you are going into e-commerce, if you are exploring that e-commerce, you should seek out an e-commerce accountant. Firstly, they are going to have an awareness of the um, the technology, the business technology, and how it connects in and how it connects into, be it Zero, be it QuickBooks Online, be it NetSuite. They're going to have an awareness of how it connects in and what's looking correct and what's not looking correct. So another small um, problem that I sometimes see is what you have is you're connecting all of these different data flows into your um, um, different systems. Sometimes they connect the wrong thing in. So I've seen a situation where all of um, import costs were connected to bank feeds, which meant that the, um, the accounts were never correct because we just had thousands and thousands of dollars in bank fees rather than um having them allocated to shipping costs. So there was there was a, a lack of awareness that w- what was happening there. It was still hitting expenses. So it was still, it wasn't a massive issue, but that was a small issue. Now, another issue that's, again, that's quite important is 
when you have two solutions that connect, they typically, they involve a clearing account. So a clearing account receives the money and then allocates the money, receives the money, allocates the money. So it's like a bucket. It should be filling up and then emptying. And Mm. what happens is an e-commerce specialist accountant knows that and they will look and they'll go, ah, that clearing account balance is reasonable. But what we find is when um, sometimes when you take over the accounts from someone who's not a specialist in that area, there's millions, literally millions of dollars sitting in that, e- that, that clearing account. So the systems haven't been set up correctly. So the taxes haven't been done correctly. So the financial statements are all incorrect. And that's a massive, massive headache. And, 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 it just, it's, it's like a, a, a leak, again, sort of referencing water flow. It's kind of like a leak that you just sort of suddenly discover that your basement's full of water and there's a problem there. Um, so that is another um, area to, to tap into an e-commerce accounting specialist. Now, another really important area, e-commerce means that you can now sell anywhere. But as we're seeing constantly in the news, all the different um, governments are put tax agencies are putting in different tax requirements. So you want an e-commerce specialist who knows and understands your tax obligations depending on where you are selling into, whether you're selling into Europe, whether you're selling into different states of America, even whether you're selling into like islands in the South Pacific, they all have their slightly different requirements. And the e-commerce tax accountant will have someone on their team who is literally focused on that all the time and will be making sure that that is being allowed for because what you don't want to do is to be selling completely unaware that you are going to be hit with a, a, a sort of a significant tax obligation Perhaps if you're selling into Europe, you're going to be hit with that massive tax obligation. You don't want that. So they're going to be able to support you to make the right decisions around your business technology infrastructure and around selling locally and overseas. And as with any person who specializes, they're going to have a better understanding of your lingo, the language that you speak. They're going to have a better understanding of what's happening in the industry. So potentially, for instance, if grants have come out, like for here in Australia, a grant has just come out for um, female founders. So all of the, the tech companies that I know that have female founders involved, I've sent them across this, this grant so they can be aware of that. And that's just like a small side incidental thing that you benefit from by going to someone who's actually a specialist in that particular area. Yeah, yeah. Very informative. Thanks for sharing that. Why is reconciliation a critical factor, Heather, of an e-commerce business? So what's really interesting is, um, as you will be aware, um, as you may be aware, Shopify is a really uh, big solution that sells out there. Many people um, are aware of it. A lot of us mistakenly call it Spotify, (laughs) the music streaming business. I know I'm always flipping between Spotify and Shopify. Right. That appears to connect to uh, Xero and QuickBooks Online and these accounting solutions. And it does appear to sort of have a connection and a relationship, but it doesn't have a pure, um, the, the transactions aren't neatly pushed into the accounting solution. To make the reconciliations neat, you have to get an intermediary solution. So, for example, there's a solution called Cinder, like Cinderella, Cinder but it's S-Y-N-D-E-R. And you you kind of, it's a conduit between um, your Shopify and your QuickBooks and your, your, or your Xero. And all of those transactions that happen are neatly pushed into your accounting solution. So when you're at your accounting solution, you're not just opening up and finding hundreds or thousands of transactions that you need to go through and manually reconcile. And it's quite complex because something may sell for $40, but it also has like a $2 shipping fee and that may have come in separately and you having to match those up as you're going through. And then there may be some multi-currency involved. 
But by having that intermediary solution in there, it means that you can do that reconciliation. It's much simpler. It comes in much cleaner. We want to make sure all of our accounts are reconciled because that means that what's happening on, our, on, on, on this side is equaling what we expected to happen. So what's happening in our bank accounts is what is actually happening. And, and, and if there's anything going astray, then we can explore it. And that's one of the benefits of going online and having these digital solutions is because we're really able to keep on top of our reconciliations. And if an issue does happen, for example, money disappears from the account or is deposited into the account and we don't understand what it is, we can chase it up on a timely basis. If you chase it up at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the financial year, trying to work out what that is, is much more difficult. So it means that your records are accurate on a timely basis and you can make informed decisions from that. Alternatively, you may find yourself in a situation that you just have this hairball mess that you have to unpick very slowly and methodically to try and sort out. So um, using a solution, as I mentioned, like um, Cinder can um, help you with that reconciliation process. It is with our clean data, surfacing that information, we can make informed decisions. We want to understand on a product level what products are selling well and returning income to us, what are profitable for us. That's what we want to know. A product that's not necessarily um, can be selling really, really well, but isn't profitable. That's what we need to be concerned with. We want to push the products that actually are profitable. Um, and maybe when the marketing spend, when we have marketing spend, allocate it to push those products that are profitable. But overall, that will improve our uh, um, operations. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Cinder and I was listening to your uh, podcast recently where you interviewed the CEO of Cinder. So it's very, very informative. Yes. Uh, and I didn't think I would ever learn about quantum physics as much as I did <laughs> listening to that to that podcast episode. Yes, yes. It's always interesting when um, uh, people have a completely separate and different life. Um, and, and the funny thing was um, my mother was actually a physics teacher, so I grew up with a periodic table in my – literally <laughs> the entire wall of my kitchen was a periodic oh table. Goodness. And um, every time she got out a milk bottle, she would drop a match in it and put an egg on top and the egg, the, the, the suction would suck the egg into the milk bottle. She was always doing um, experiments <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been interesting growing up in a, uh, in a household where, you know, there's all these physics types of experiments uh, going around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it was just, it was the language that was spoken. You know, we talked about friction, we talked about centripetal forces, we talked about this, we talked about that. Yeah, that was just the language that was spoken in the house about physics, yeah. Wow. Now, why is there a trend towards businesses adopting subscription or recurring billing models? Yeah, look, I thought that this was an interesting um, one to talk about. And the funny thing is, probably in the media, you see, ah, oh, there's a trend towards subscription bottles. But again, I'll pull back to the milk bottle. Um, my mum had milk delivered every single day, and that was effectively a subscription service. So when you come into e-commerce, and in fact, for many, many businesses, if you can get people to sign up for a particular product or service, that means you have a guaranteed recurring income coming in that helps you in managing your cash flow, that helps you in producing predicting the demand so you can manage that capacity. So it may be, okay, um, I'm selling this product. I can actually negotiate to purchase the product in and manage the purchases of that. And I might be in a more powerful position to negotiate a discount. Alternatively, it means I'm selling a service and I can, okay, I can take on an extra staff member because I know this level of work is guaranteed to me. It also helps you test, refine and optimize services that you, you are selling. So you could put something out there as a subscription service, maybe something light 
And if it actually, if people actually take it up, then you go, okay, well, that was the bronze version of that. Maybe I can go to the silver version or maybe I can go to the gold version. But you can actually put something out there at a low level to um, test it and refine it and see what they want. And what it does help is foster long-term relationships with clients, which We want sticky relationships with clients because that will help sustain our business and sustain what we can offer them. Um, So it's interesting because sort of common subscription options are you would get a, um, a beauty box delivered once a month or you'd get a magazine delivered once a month. But I was working within an engineering firm and um, I said, why don't we, you you keep providing, um, additional support to some of your clients. Why don't we offer a maintenance level support subscription to these clients, but you still within that have the option to charge them for the additional services that you provide. So what they did was they they, they wrote out and they defined this product. They said, okay, if you need this additional maintenance level, it's going to cost, and I think it was like $1,000 a month, But what we will do is we will guarantee a phone call response to your issue and then we will put strategies in place. And they sold that to multiple clients. So what it was was we will respond by phone to your needs, but that was it. It just stopped at that and then anything else was charged on top of that. So this service-based business suddenly was able to I think they, they signed up 12 customers for that. So they, they were getting an extra $12,000 in a month to answer um, what ended up only being a very few phone calls, but gave them that buffer to be able to support clients when they needed it. And many of the clients signed up and just let it roll and they never um, 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 pulled out of that. And I'm not suggesting that it's a sneaky thing to do. I'm suggesting that you're signing up to make sure that there's that buffer and capacity. When you need the support, they will be able to offer you that support. And I think that that's really interesting. What could you offer on a regular basis that your clients would actually say, hey, yeah, but we this is an extra service that we would pay for. And, and in the e-commerce business, there's so many options in the e-commerce business. Um, and I know that like I love the subscription boxes and I'll sign up to anything that looks kind of cool and interesting out there. And um, there, there's a, a recurring billing service called Chargebee and they automate all of that for you. So, so making all of that functionality quite streamlined for you and you plug in at the front end of it the um, um, solution that receipts the payments. So that that's kind of separate. And then it will all feed into your um, your Xero uh, or your um, QuickBooks solutions or whatever accounting solutions that you have there. So with there, anything that you're kind of offering out there, there's an app that's going to simplify it. And there's that additional income stream. So it's kind of exciting that in the e-commerce business, if you actually just find out about an app, you're like, okay, how can I use that? What service can it provide? Ah, I could um, I could uh, gain extra income just from using this sort of app. And I know I, I have a, a beauty subscription and I know that the um, box comes and it looks like it's all the free samples that the company's been given, but I'm, I don't mind. I get to test them out. So it's just kind of like any excess stock goes into it. So it's like a grab bag. I don't know what's going to come and uh, I'm really happy about it. And they get guaranteed income from it. Super useful. Wow. Yeah. Do you subscribe to any subscription boxes like that? Yeah. I mean, uh, magazines, internet services as well, uh, mm. coaching services. Heather, something you know worth mentioning is that a business that has their revenues coming from subscription or recurring is much more valuable. The valuation of that business is uh, two to ten times greater than a business that's transactional. Yeah, absolutely. And so the you know from from an exit standpoint, it's just a much more valuable business because you've got recurring revenues. Yeah, and I think that it's something that a lot of people could think about doing 
because a lot of us don't have, um, I, I like signing up for them. It's becoming very common. One of my clients makes ceramic buttons that quilters would sew onto their uh, quilts. And um, she just has, and they're only like, I think the subscription's like $2 a month. It's so small, but the buttons probably cost 50, 50 cents a month. So yeah, it's just this massive, I think she has like 10,000 subscribers. It's just insane. But uh, <laughs> what you can do with it. Yeah. You can be creative with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Heather, what does a typical e-commerce app stack look like? So I think it will depend on what product or service that you're offering um, via e-commerce. And it will depend on where you're operating. And I would look around at what's common at the moment um, because some things will be there. And, but then something else new comes along on the block and it's worth exploring. I would talk to your accountant. I would talk to your website designer as well about this because they're probably going to be involved with this. But I would do a lot of planning and investigation and research up front and even um, reach out to some of the e-commerce players. I think there's even sites that you can go and go, okay, I'm going to do a business similar to this. And I think there's sites that will actually tell you what other businesses app, app stack, I call it an app stack, is. So you want obviously some some sort of solution to receipt the money in. Um, and that can come something like go cardless or pinch payments or um, PayPal, some sort of um, solution to receipt the money in. You want something shop front, and we've talked about Shopify before and we've talked about the other platforms and they will um, connect into your Amazons and your Ebays and your Etsy's out there. I think Etsy's Etsy's been proven to be a bit of a difficult one for people to connect into. You then, um, I mentioned uh, the reconciliation solution, Cinder. There's other solutions like that, but that, that that's one to, to think about. Of course, you've got your uh, accounting stack, which is your Xero or your QuickBooks or, or your solutions like that. and when you're making these decisions, make sure that they have that integration option for you. There's no point in going for something cheap and sweet, but if it's it's if it's sitting in a, in, in a silo, that will give you extra work. There may be the option, we mentioned Zapier briefly before, Zapier can sometimes take information from siloed solutions and push it into other solutions, but you need to make sure that option is um, available to you. So you will find um, if you're going selling abroad, you may well have to be dealing with multi-currency and some of the solutions deal with that very well. There's solutions out there like Air Wallex or Wise, which used to be Transfer Wise, but Wise that assist you in um, transferring and moving monies from different countries and in, in different currencies and um, paying credit cards, et cetera, in different countries. So let me explain that further. With, say, Airwallex, I can set up a faux bank account of American dollars, of UK pounds, of Japanese yen, and if I need to pay my supplier, I can put the money into it and then it just trans out of transfers out of that bank account to them. I've not set up a Japanese account. It's all sitting within Air Wallet, so it actually makes my life a lot simpler because it all sits within there and does the payments, et cetera, can happen from within there. So I don't have the complexities of setting up a bank account overseas, which I probably would have a hard time doing as a small operator, and the, the rates are quite good. But you need to explore what, what suits and works for yourself. Um, there was another one I was going to suggest, which – I'm not the marketing CRM expert, but one that has been recommended to me is Georgias, G-O-R-G-I-A-S, which is an all-in-one help desk and live chat for e-commerce stores. Um, and you will need a uh, smart shipping option. So um, one that has been recommended to me is Starship IT. Um, I went to a... Uh, a live panel discussion the other day and the guy was ra raving about that because he said it was automating every step of the fulfillment process for him um, and just simplifies that. 
And another one, this is another cool one that this guy also mentioned to me, which was Parabola, which is a drag and drop productivity tool that runs in your browsers that allows you with no code to um, customize what you're doing with your e-commerce solution. So you have your core stack, but then you will find things that will fit in around that. And when you're thinking of your stack, you kind of want it to work like Lego bricks and that everything kind of plugs in nicely. And if you decide something's gone up in price or you don't like the functionality or you want to move away from it, hopefully you're in a position where you can unplug and then plug something back in. That's what the benefit is of these solutions. And when you're coming to choose them, make sure you understand how easy it is to move off them as well as to move on them. Well, you're a wealth of knowledge <laughs> in this space and it's amazing. You've been so generous. I really, really am grateful for you sharing this information. As we cl come close to the end of this, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one's an easy one. How can listeners get in contact with you? But before you answer that, my last question is going to be, uh, some final words of wisdom, information or advice you would give in 30 seconds or less to an e-commerce business that you haven't shared before. So let's do the, how can listeners get in contact with you first? I can be found. Thank you very much for that, Salam. I can be found at, at Heather Smith AU on all different platforms. <clears throat> um, and I do recommend you um, subscribe to my um, accounting apps newsletter, which is at heathersmithau.com and that is a newsletter that lets you know all about all the different accounting apps that are coming out um, in the ecosystem. So I encourage you to subscribe and see whether it's got the information in it that uh, is of interest to you. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And some final words of wisdom before we, f we finish off. So what I would suggest is if you are considering going into e-commerce, I really like it when e-commerce businesses grow out of retail businesses. And I see um, there's a very um, a lovely synergy there in that you can enjoy the benefits of being in retail, that community spirit, that busyness of having actual customers, but you can also expand into e-commerce and have that wonderful cash flow and have a client base all across the world. And that's that's kind of what I would consider. You don't have to be one or the other you can be both and then we can plug a subscription in there and you'll be you'll be wonderful <laughs> so thank you so much salam for having me on the show and, and sharing uh, all this uh, accounting technology it's been great awesome thanks heather smith appreciate you thanks for listening to the e-commerce money map podcast if you'd like to hear more episodes, you can find them at ecommercemoneymap.com or on your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to learn more about the e-commerce accounting hub, visit ecommerceaccountinghub.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on the e-commerce money map podcast.